Hey everyone, welcome to the Slice of Healthcare podcast. I'm your host, Jarrett Taylor. Joining me today is the CEO of Identify Health, Vicki Damas. Did I say the last name right, Vicki? I did, right? No? You did, you did. Thank okay. you, Jared. Yes. <laughs> you always have to ask. You always have to ask. And it's a great way to, to get you laughing to start off the episode, which always makes for an even better episode. So excited to have you here. Real quick, for those in our audience that maybe this is the first time, which those are the best people, by the way, the ones that never heard of you before and now get to hear of you, um, tell them a little bit about yourself where, and then kind of how, how you came to, to be the CEO of this company and, and building Identify Health. Great. Well, first of all, uh, Jared, excited to be with you and uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I am a chemical engineer, physical chemist by training. Uh, I sometimes tell people that the reason I got into engineering was because I actually wanted to apply to the astronaut program and be a mission specialist. So I decided I needed a PhD. And I started working on portable magnetic resonance for that um, at UC Berkeley. It wasn't until I did a few things, postdocs, et cetera, and I ended up working at my first startup, uh, leveraging magnetic resonance to build a new diagnostic platform. Uh, it, it happened so that our first product was an infectious disease. And it was uh, when we realized that we, the ability of helping patients, and I think that was the, right, we were building a product um, that was really um, helping diagnose uh, whether a patient had bacterial or, or yeast infections so that we can determine the, the, the right type of treatment. So I fell in love with the idea of building tools um, to help doctors and medical researchers uh, help patients. So that became sort of the, the core theme of my career. So I spent the last 25 years working at different startups, building teams, building, uh, building different technology platforms. Uh, the uh, One of the exciting parts, I was part of the team all, that uh, developed, uh, I guess, uh, the initiatives, uh, the life sciences initiatives within Google um, that spun out as Google Life Sciences, which uh, then was rebranded to Verily. And uh, from there, we ended up building a ton of teams. Think of Google Life Sciences as an incubator. So got really that... that um, I don't know, love and passion for solving problems in the space, working with experts to identify the right problems to solve, to leverage, uh, leveraging the, the mission was in, in general leverage AI tools and what made Google, Google uh, to really solve problems worth solving with incredible teams. So um, after that, I, I followed one of my mentors, uh, Jeff Huber, to uh, Grail, a cancer diagnostic company. And about three and a half years ago, um, I uh, got contacted by Jonathan Rothberg, a serial entrepreneur uh, in the space, who uh, really wanted to connect based on common contacts, etc. And I heard about what at the time was called Tesseract Health, which was looking to leverage multiple imaging modalities to capture data from the from the retina. Um, that was the space that we had explored at Google um, and in introducing the space of leveraging AI uh, to, uh, um, to really interpret retinal images uh, was something that really um, I felt very strongly about in terms of the potential of this tool. So I, you know, it didn't take very long between the, asset, you know, again, a problem worth solving that I felt passionate about. Uh, thinking that that's something I felt comfortable based on where the company was at the time coming in and helping uh, really set the right strategy, built the right team. Um, and uh, of course, getting to work with Jonathan and um, there were some incredible investors that had come together um, to back the company at the time. So it was 2021. So it's been a blast. Uh, uh, so and that brings us to today uh, with uh, being now having rebranded Tesseract to identify health uh, as part of that whole, as I said, resetting the strategy and figuring out um, the focus of the company. Let's talk a little bit about the the rebrand. So, what were some of the the main factors into? I, I do 
I, I like both names personally because I think of isn't the uh, wasn't the other one from the movie <laughs> Thor? It's it's the fourth dimensional cube. Yes, like it's okay. like it says. <laughs> yeah, uh, like Loki. What Loki tries to 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 take. Um, yeah, it's uh, so I, I like either, but I do like. I think obviously the new name, um, it, it, it allows people to immediately know what you do. Right. But, um, can you talk a little, what were some of the factors that went into this rebrand? Yeah, for sure. Uh, so I think you said it right. I, I like the old name too. It's like, I, I am a little bit of a techie geek. So of course you, you gotta like your sci-fi, but, um, it, it was a little bit esoteric because, and also very much focused on, the overall general idea that Jonathan had at the time of adding all these multiple imaging modalities to get not only 2D images, 3D cross sections, et cetera, et cetera, molecular imaging. For me, um, I actually pivoted the company to say, you know what, like, I think what's really needed to democratize access to retinal imaging is let's take the first modality that people understand. It's well used. Um, smaller barriers to entry, I'll say, and focus on making it so easy to use that anyone can use it. So we can actually bring it closer to the patients, make it cheap, make it accessible. Um, so um, it became sort of a lot more about not what technology we're using or, you know, why we're leveraging AI and automation to do all of the things that, I, that, that, that I'm uh, mentioning. Uh, but it was also about what the company was trying to do. I wanted a name that was super descriptive. So we've replaced the Y and identify with EYE, the I, the organ, because we're looking in the eye to identify disease. So I felt that, uh, again, the team spent a lot of time and energy to come up with a name that we felt describes what we're trying to accomplish. Um, and, uh, I don't know, hopefully you like the name. I love it. <laughs> this is I love it. Uh, so talk me through a little bit about, uh, I, I guess a walkthrough of how the technology yeah. works in detecting eye diseases earlier than the conventional methods that exist. Sure. Um, so, so right now, uh, first of all, our first focus will be diabetic retinopathy screening, but there are a lot of other biomarkers in the retina, um, that, uh, we're hoping to leverage to build tools for screening, monitoring, et cetera. Um, so we'll start a little bit with the, with a basic problem, which is before you can interpret the data, you actually have to capture really good data. Um, the, in order to do that, typically, uh, you have to go to an ophthalmologist, um, a well-trained technician, at least like, right. With a big piece of equipment, expensive, relatively cumbersome. You almost have to be sort of like, they, they call them a, a, a qualified photographer to use some of these devices. So that's problem number one. Uh, and then problem number two is you have to have someone that when they look at the data, they can interpret it. So that's usually a retinal specialist. Uh, it, it depends on what it is that we're looking at. Uh, but, but again, like ever since even like, you know, the earlier days of the thalmoscopes, um, you know, uh, uh, being created, um, retinal specialists and medical researchers have been able to pick up some of the issues. So what we're doing is we're actually automating the entire thing. Um, so we are leveraging AI and automation to actually look at things like, is the patient, first of all, present? Are there um, eyelids open so we can actually see? Um, can we actually find the pupil? Because it's almost like taking a photo through a keyhole have to be at the right place before you can actually focus and zoom. So we've built all of that automation that has checks and balances to make sure that all of the normal things that a human might do when you're trying to <laughs> capture a photo that you typically would need a trained person next to them to guide them we're actually automating that and we're using ai to check whether the quality of the image is sufficient to be interpreted then the second part comes um, with building algorithms whether you wish like the first one is as simple as like a disease classifier to say do i see uh, more than mild diabetic retinopathy, that's going to be our first AI based diagnostic or screening product. Um, the way that that's built is obviously built on ton of data and teaching the algorithm to, 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 to know what a no more than mild diabetic retinopathy looks like versus it does. Um, and, and that's done in, in, in the typical fashion. But, um, what's super exciting to me beyond our ability to use AI at the moment 
to automate tasks that a human would typically do. This is a very well understood task, what an ophthalmologist looks like to actually grade and, and assess if someone has diabetic retinopathy is the huge potential that the space has in leveraging AI to really extract more information than meets the eye. Um, and uh, so, uh, yeah. Love it. What, I guess, uh, let, let's talk a little bit about accessibility. Why is it important to make eye screening technology more accessible in a point of care setting? Uh, sure. So diabetes is a huge problem. So we're starting with our first indication and, and I'll use that as an example, but I think we can extrapolate. Um, we have about 38 million or more um, uh, people living with diabetes in the United States. Right now, um, there is a screening recommendation that annually a person with diabetes should get screened. There is a reimbursement code, insurance coverage, but there's really low compliance. About 50% of diabetics get screened. And note that diabetic retinopathy is the leading cause of blindness in the U.S. Uh, for adults of working age. Um, so this is a huge problem. Uh, and when you're thinking about how many, especially knowing that socioeconomic factors have really a big uh, play here um, in the ability or someone having the disease and being aware and getting screened, we really want to make it easier. We know at least 80 to 90 percent um, of the uh, people living with diabetes will actually see a primary care doctor, whereas a lot of them will not go to an ophthalmologist. It's an extra appointment, taking day time off and losing pay and, and all of that. So bringing it to the primary care um, and making it seamless, uh, it's really going to help with getting to the patients. What challenges still exist that, that you're working to navigate? You mean uh, for us, particularly in launching our first product or in let's, this space? In the space, let's let's still talk about accessibility, yeah. maybe accessibility yeah. challenges that still exist today, like particularly with underserved communities. Would love to hear your take on, you know, maybe what's being done to, to help those communities. Sure. I, I think a lot of it has to do with we don't have enough resources is number one, right? Like I think that we have very few healthcare providers and the numbers are not looking great. So um, that automatically adds to it. But then I, I spoke a little bit about this particular example, diabetic retinopathy screening. Think a little bit of the person who has to take you know, half a day off to actually go, and this is without pay, to see their primary care doctor, who then is going to refer them to go and see a specialist, which then they're going to have to wait for quite a bit of time to schedule. And, and it's hard to come ahead and say, so there is an education component that also like as humans, we are not wired to say, oh, I feel totally fine. I'm just going to go and check my eyes. So usually you go to see the doctor or a lot of people go to see the doctor when they have pain or when they're starting to have blurred vision and things are happening, which is too late. Uh, and I think part of the, the, the issue I still go back to has to do with awareness, accessibility, um, and, and in general, limited resources from, from the healthcare side. So if we can use technology, which is what we're hoping to do, and uh, AI and automation uh, being really the, the big focus here, uh, to really automate tasks that are simple, well understood, to almost triage and figure out who are the patients that really have to go see a doctor. You can also give them the data that says, we're really worried, like you should go see a doctor. Um, their primary care doctor can actually really explain like what's what's happening. You really need to get your glucose under control. Um, there's a really a lot of value we can add by, by doing that. What's next for the company from here, Vicky? Well, we are super excited. We are full speed ahead in uh, uh, the development of our of our platform and our first uh, screening product. And we have uh, a, a lot of uh, exciting next steps uh, for next year planned, um, including our uh, commercial commercial launch. So obviously, um, assuming that everything with FDA goes according to plan and uh, but uh, yeah, starting to help patients. So that's <laughs> I love it. Well, I'm super excited for you and the team, and please keep us updated on any announcements that are coming out. We want to definitely be on top of it and uh, really appreciate your time here today. Thanks for coming on. I will do. Thank you for having me.